California is America's largest, most influential, and most powerful state. With a population nearing 40 million people, there are more people living in California than in the entirety of Canada. And with a total economy size of $3.4 trillion, California alone would be the world's fifth largest economy ahead of even the gigantic India, with 35 times the population. The two largest engines inside of California that fuel all of this economic and population success are Greater Los Angeles in the south, America's second largest urban area home to approximately 13 million million people, and the San Francisco Bay Area further to the north, home to approximately 8 million more. These are California's two greatest centers of population and financial power, but traveling between both of them has always been a bit of an ordeal. More than 380 miles away from each other, about the same distance as London is from Dundee, Scotland, a typical drive between Los Angeles and San Francisco takes at least six hours to complete, if not even more, depending on the state of traffic. The only other real alternative choice available is to visit an airport, pass through security, board a plane, and fly the roughly hour and a half journey between them in the sky. Today, so many people choose this alternative that it has become the second busiest flight route over the entire United States. Not only are these choices time-consuming, expensive, and annoying to many, but they're also not exactly ideal for meeting California's increasingly stringent emissions targets. And that's why, beginning back in the late 1990s, the state of California began seriously looking into the feasibility of adding in a better, more sensible third option between the cities. High-speed rail which would be a first for the United States. On paper, the concept would make an enormous amount of sense for the state. It would provide significantly quicker transportation between the two big cities than driving, and was supposed to be a cheaper alternative to flying. And with numerous stops along the way that would better connect and serve even more of California's population, the benefits of rapid transit between centers of commerce would be more accessible to more people than ever within the state, with profound economic benefits. And with more people opting to take the train over flying or driving, California could also work to cut down on their overall statewide emissions as well. The proposal to begin construction on the rail was passed by California voters 14 years ago back in 2008, but the trouble ever since then has been that the project is grinding along at a pace that is now dramatically over budget to the tune of tens of billions of dollars and several years behind schedule. So what's been going on? Why has California specifically, and America in general, struggled so much with building a legitimate high-speed rail line while countries as small as Spain have more than 3,000 kilometers of high-speed rail lines right now? Let's get into it. First of all, let's talk about the facts on the ground within the United States as they exist today. Specifically, there aren't really any high-speed rail lines in the country yet. There's technically the Asala Express that's run by Amtrak across the Northeast from Washington, D.C. to Boston that features America's fastest train speeds of 150 miles per hour, but only across a small stretch of just 34 miles out of the entire 457-mile route, while most of the high-speed part takes place along the 226-mile section between Union State in Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania Station in New York City. Between these two cities, the Asala Express is capable of running passengers in 2 hours and 45 minutes, while averaging a speed of around 82 miles an hour when factoring in the various stops along the way. While perhaps not exactly what comes to mind when imagining true high-speed rail like in Japan or Europe, it still beats driving between DC and New York by over an hour, and it successfully managed to capture a full 75% of all the air and train commuters between the two cities. The Asala service has proved to be a resounding success for commuter travel in the American Northeast, and the California High-Speed Rail project is looking to dramatically expand upon that success in the West. The overall plan, as proposed back in 2008, was set to be carried out in two distinct phases. Phase 1 of the plan would aim to link up San Francisco in the north down to Los Angeles and Anaheim in the south via the Central Valley, with 10 additional stations in between them. Once completed, the system would be capable of transporting passengers between San Francisco and Los Angeles at speeds of more than 200 miles per hour, in a non-stop time of just 2 hours and 40 minutes, and at an advertised cost back in 2008 of only $50 a passenger one way. Upon this initial phase's completion, Phase 2 of the line would commence with further 
further extensions connecting Modesto, Stockton, and the state capital of Sacramento to the system in the north, along with San Bernardino, Marietta, Escondido, and ultimately San Diego in the south as well. Fully connecting all of California's most populous cities and regions together by high-speed rail, capable of moving people anywhere else in the system within hours. But the benefits would extend far beyond simply moving people across the state quicker. Back in 2009, the Rail Authority released projections that the system would ultimately create 450,000 permanent new jobs across the state through the increased rates of people commuting into major cities further away than they ordinarily would have without the rail. And for a region like the San Joaquin Valley in particular, the benefits of the rail would almost certainly outweigh anywhere else in the state. Today, this region is is the most impoverished part of California, and it's unfortunately been that way for a long time. A largely rural area, the valley is California's most substantial contributor to the agricultural and oil industries, and is only a few densely populated clusters of population like Fresno, Bakersfield, Stockton, and Merced. However, six of the counties inside of the valley rank as the top six counties in the whole state of California for the highest percentage of residents living beneath the poverty line, and they rank even among the most important impoverished counties across the entire United States. Of the top five poorest metropolitan areas in the entire United States, three of them are here in the San Joaquin Valley. Nearly one in three children living in the valley are impoverished. The median household income is 40% beneath what it is across the rest of the state, and the situation has been constantly evolving since the 1990s. As the cost of living in the hugely populated, geographically nearby urban areas like San Francisco and Los Angeles have skyrocketed, more and more young families and small businesses have been given no other choice than to leave, and many of them have settled in the San Joaquin Valley. Thus, major cities in the valley like Stockton, Modesto, and others have become increasingly important as commuter cities for working-class people into San Francisco, while Bakersfield has become the same for commuters into Los Angeles. And thus, the population and real estate values within the valley have been increasing for decades. But the area's transportation system hasn't been able to keep up with the pace. And the California High Speed Rail project promises to alleviate a lot of these issues in the community here. Not only will it enable commuters to move more quickly to regions with higher paying jobs like San Francisco or Los Angeles, but it will also bring with it new jobs and opportunities. And the cities that ultimately receive stations like Bakersfield, Fresno, and Merced should see increased growth and development prop up around them as well. And by 2080, the initial projections assumed that the system would reduce auto traffic across all of California's highways and roads to such an extent that it would cut down approximately 400 billion miles worth of vehicle travel within the state, which would have obvious environmental benefits to boot. But now, here's the thing. All of this was proposed to voters in the state back in 2008 by the California High Speed Rail Authority, an organization that had been set up by the state government 12 years previously back in 1996. Their proposal estimated a total cost of construction for the project at $33 billion, and that the first trains would begin running by 2020, just 12 years later. $9 billion of state-issued bonds were issued to help fund the project, with the rest of the funding expected to come in from the federal U.S. government and private investors. However, we're obviously now in 2022, more than 14 years after the proposition was passed, and two years beyond when service was first expected to begin. What's more, the total cost for just the 500-mile-long Phase 1 of the system, linking San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim, has ballooned near nearly threefold from the original sticker price to at least $105 billion now, already making it the largest single investment in California history and one of America's most ambitious civil engineering projects ever. And the final price is almost certainly going to be even higher than that, because that estimate is based on some old assumptions back from 2019 like an average inflation rate of just 3%. Obviously, with annual inflation rates currently running hot at well over 8%, a lot of these assumptions are outdated, and the final price tag will almost certainly be higher in the end. 
For context though, even with the 2019 projections, that is still about one-fifth the price of the entire U.S. interstate highway system that expands for a hundred times longer across nearly 50,000 miles throughout all 50 U.S. states and Puerto Rico and accounts for a quarter of all vehicle miles driven by all 320 million plus Americans. But it's not only the costs that have been dramatically scaled up for the California high-speed rail since being brought to voters back in 2008. Construction on the system ever since has focused on building out the 171-mile center segment across the Central Valley first that will link Bakersfield in the south with Merced in the north, giving commuters the opportunities to transfer from Merced onto the pre-existing Altamont Corridor Express and San Joaquin's Amtrak rail routes to link to either Sacramento or the Bay Area, and a transfer from Bakersfield in the south on Amtrak's throughway bus service down to Los Angeles. However, even this initial central segment is currently not projected to be completed until the end of this decade, around 2029. After it's hopefully completed by then, the next major focus will be on completing the extension in the north towards Gilroy and San Jose, which includes the southernmost terminus of the already existing Caltrain rail line, which will ultimately enable high-speed trains to finally run from San Francisco down to Bakersfield. The full completion of Phase 1 linking San Francisco to Los Angeles and Anaheim is now not expected to be finished any time before 2033, with room for even further delays in the future. And that's not to even mention the eventual planned extensions towards San Diego and Sacramento, which at this rate, nobody even really knows about. At the same time, the latest figures for estimated one-way ticket prices on the system between San Francisco and Los Angeles are from 2015, and were already inflated up to $86 from the $50 that was initially advertised to voters back in 2008. When adjusted to inflation today in 2022, that $86 estimate from 2015 is really more like $105 now which is very often even more expensive than just taking a one-way flight between the two cities would be. And there have been numerous, numerous setbacks for the project that have been causing all of these issues. One of the most significant is simply the reality of California's geography. There are three major mountain ranges for the rail to eventually cross through, like the Southern Coast Ranges, Transverse Ranges, and Peninsular Ranges that, specifically, require lengthy and expensive tunnels through active seismic zones. And moreover, California has the second highest average real estate prices of any state in the country, making the cost of purchasing and acquiring land for the rail to traverse prohibitively expensive. The project has struggled with acquiring necessary land ever since its inception, but even now, there are still more than 200 parcels of land that the railway needs to acquire in order to capture a 52-mile section in Kings County to finish out the central Bakersfield to Merced segment, which isn't really good for them because construction on this route has obviously already begun, and they really need that land at pretty much any price. And the people who own the land can sell it to them for inflated prices. And thus, as of 2014, the World Bank reported that the per kilometer price tag of California's high-speed rail system was standing at approximately $56 million, which is freakishly higher than in other countries like China where it's more like $19 million, or about one-third of the price. Even in Europe, similar high-speed rail projects have only cost between $25 and $39 million per kilometer of track. But the prices in California aren't equal everywhere. Part of the reason why the plan was to build the central segment of the high-speed rail first across the Central Valley in the first place, widely heckled as the train to nowhere between Bakersfield and Merced, is just because that's simply the cheapest place to actually build out the infrastructure, because the land is pretty much just flat, rural farmland everywhere. Here, the construction figures are more like $11.4 million per kilometer, which is highly comparable to international prices elsewhere, like China or Europe. It's only when the rail eventually starts getting into the mountains and the seismically active areas further towards Los Angeles and San Francisco that the prices truly explode exponentially. And that's leaving a lot of people concerned, because the expected funding that was advertised back in 2008 has also been hard to actually come by in the decade plus since. 
With construction costs going up and the subsequent costs in ticket prices going up alongside of them, the rail's competitiveness with airlines between San Francisco and LA has been put into question by many private investors who believe that most Californians will ultimately just continue choosing to fly over taking the rail, especially if flying ends up being cheaper and ultimately ends up being quicker in the end. And it's not just private investment that has been hard to come by either. In 2019, the Trump administration canceled nearly $1 billion in federal funding for the railway, citing frustrations over the lack of progress in construction and budget overruns. And last year in 2021, the much more train-friendly Biden administration passed through an infrastructure bill that granted $66 billion to Amtrak to further develop the Asala Express in the Northeast and to build out new services elsewhere across the country. But it didn't include any precisely designated funding for California's high-speed rail. Some sources believe that California may only get as little as $5 billion in funding for the project from the bill, which won't really help all that much with a presently estimated $105 billion total price tag. There are grave fears among many in California's government that once the central segment between Bakersfield and Merced is completed, at a price tag of around $23 billion, the state will then struggle to find the funding required to finish out the estimated $50 billion leg from Bakersfield to Los Angeles that requires lengthy and expensive mountain tunnels, and the estimated $22 billion leg connecting the Central Valley to San Francisco. If the tens of billions of dollars worth of additional funding can't be found, California may end up being left with what the critics have been slamming the project for all along. An isolated, high-speed train to nowhere through the Central Valley from Bakersfield, population 380,000, to Merced, population 80,000. And since the funding to ultimately complete the project remains too low, the project has been plagued with ineffective management, and no clear guidance from the state government on what the project's actual next steps are going to look like. And then, the COVID-19 pandemic certainly didn't do the project any favors either. Construction workers currently employed on the project are at less than half of the numbers they were estimated to be at by this point before the pandemic. Overall, if it's ever finished, the California High Speed Railway could provide enormous potential benefits to the millions of citizens of California. But in order to do so, the project is struggling against the enormous challenges of geography, economics, demographics, America's own cultural and historical preferences for cars and planes, the legal system, and more. All of which combine to make the project's ultimate future uncertain. The success or failure of America's first truly major high-speed rail system is literally hanging in the balance, and it has a ton of catching up to do with the rest of the world. But to be fair, any engineering project like this has its challenges, and if you're anything like me, understanding STEM subjects like engineering or math have never come easy. But luckily, we can all get our own little dose of scientific learning from Brilliant. Whether you're looking to learn something completely new or you're just trying to brush up on a few topics, the best way to learn something is by doing the work yourself. And there's no better place for that than on Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive STEM learning platform that helps you learn concepts by working through them in a visual, hands-on way. And you can get started on any number of courses from more basic concepts like the physics of the everyday and casino probability to more advanced fields like chemistry and quantum computing and many more. Regardless of which subject it is that you want to learn about, you get to learn at your own pace. You can learn on the go with our mobile app and, most importantly of all, you get to enjoy the rewarding process of understanding things that you never thought were possible before. And if you ever get stuck on a particular question, Brilliant never punishes you or impedes your progress. Instead, they'll give you an in-depth explanation to guide you along your learning path. And best of all, you can try out Brilliant right now for free with the link down in the description or by clicking the button that's here on screen right now. And the first 200 people to sign up will also get 20% off of Brilliant Premium for a year of STEM learning across 2022. And as always, thank you so much for watching.